Welcome to the Mystery College Podcast. I'm Jake Zen, and today we're here with Clint Sabom. He is an executive spiritual coach of the Franz Barton system and has gone through all 10 steps of initiation into hermetics. Welcome to the show, Clint. Oh, I'm honored. It's so fantastic to be here with you, and I'm very excited. Thank you. Pleasure having you on. I'm really curious to ask, what got you started on the journey to towards working with initiation neuromatics? I'm wondering if there were systems or practices you had explored before, or or you just found initiation neuromatics and that was it? Well, I mean, a couple of things. I had a spontaneous kundalini awakening when I was 21. But what happened with that was that the spiritual kind of got ahead of the psychological development. So integration took a while. And I studied with a spiritual teacher in my 20s and was able to get that uh, more integrated, the spiritual and the psychological. And then at age 30, I went to live in a silent monastery that was a a uh, Christian monastery off of the Catholic style of Benedictine monasteries, a silent monastery, a contemplative monastery, and it was under the Episcopal Church. And that monastery experience lasted about six months. I seriously thought about becoming a monk at one time. Um, and that kind of really jump started me into mysticism. So my background before starting Franz Barden, I would say, was mainly in Christian mysticism, although um, I did work with other teachers like a shaman and Buddhist teachers in my 20s, but I kind of came around to making my peace with my native faith, and so it was mainly Christian mysticism, and uh, what happened with Barden was really interesting. Um, I, I may be getting the names wrong here, but I was reading a book called The Gnostic Tarot, and it was by a professor that was retired, Lee Irwin, and he referenced Barden a few times, and it sounded so amazing that he had been referencing initiation into hermetics that I just ordered the book off of Amazon. And, of course, I read it all the way through before starting it, uh, as many people do, and I was blown away by it. And so I began to go through the steps. And the steps was not a quick process for me. Um, it took a while, probably a total of six years. Um, and... You know, part of why I took as long as I did is I was not impatient to knock them off. I was very patient. I was enjoying the journey. I was enjoying the process. So I basically just gave myself plenty of time to work through all of the steps. And, um, you know, it felt very synchronous. It felt like synchronicity coming across Martin. So... I'm really glad that happened, and that's the main system I work with in my own spirituality as well as with clients right now. Yeah, and I'm really curious, too, about um, your experience and and how, what types of values or principles did spending six years going through Franz Barton's system teach you? What was, what was the, what was the, what were some of the biggest gifts or insights that you derived from the practice? Well, you know, I would say it does come down to things that are stretching the limit into paranormal abilities. And to be honest, I probably first got into it to gain more personal power. But what the biggest takeaway was is that uh, it, it seemed like a journey of healing to me. It seemed like the purpose of Franz Barden was actually healing. And it was a very healing process. As far as values, I surrender to divine providence. And I basically ask divine providence, and I'm comfortable with the word God, too, for everything, all of the time. You know, I don't 
um, you know, as far as values, there's certain things in Barton's practice that I don't do. I don't, um, transfer my consciousness into other people. I don't want to invade other people's space. I don't want to do any of the left-hand path, any of the, uh, darker stuff. Um, I keep it really simple and very safe and, um, definitely pray a lot. Mm, and definitely pray a lot. And I'm curious about the, your background with Christian mysticism and how prayer is involved with your relationship to the Franz Barden framework. Um, well, with prayer, with, uh, the Christian mysticism, especially in the monastery, it was a lot of Gregorian chant and there was time for silent prayer too. Um, there were some takeaways. I'm a big fan of the Jesus prayer, uh, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me, a sinner. And I know the sinner can trigger certain people, but I just see sin as something that's imperfection, inhuman imperfection. So um, I have a very open view of that word, so I'm more comfortable with it. And so um, I basically continue uh, with uh, some of the things from the Christian monastery, but really it just... I think the big takeaway from the time in Christian mysticism is getting a big connection to the Akasha. Um, I'm able to go into the Akasha and do transmissions for clients, and it's a very natural process for me. And, um, you know, it's really a kind of a connection to God. I also, when I was at the Christian uh, monastery. I read The Power of Now by Eckhart Tolle and was able to go into that deep silence where you kind of find the off switch to your mind in rest and pure being. And so those were some of the takeaways. Step one, for instance, that many people get stuck on was very quickly for me. I was kind of already there. And I was already there in some of the um, steps. I had already astral traveled. I had already gained some clairvoyant abilities. So um, I definitely had a head start. Yeah, it's wonderful that you had a background with Christian mysticism and that you know you did have access to you know a lot of internal resourcefulness and resources like Eckhart Tolle. Christian mysticism and also some of the other path working you did previously before getting into the Barden work. I'm uh, I'm wondering what are some of the chief things do you see that that your clients uh, tend to ha have issues with that help that prevent them from getting the results that they want or having the patience or clarity needed to proceed with Barden system. Oh, that's a fantastic question. And the answer is a very common answer that they don't get steady with the practice and practice every day because life situations get in the way. And I think there's a lot of stress in this day and age in the world. And a lot of people feel stressed in their life circumstances get in the way of them practicing every day. So that is the most that is the most common thing I hear. Sometimes, too, one of the common things that clients struggle on is uh, they, they think the minimum requirements for certain steps are actually larger than they are. So I'm a big fan of keeping it moving, keeping it moving, going on to the next steps, continuing to work previous steps so you never really graduate from a step you're continuing to work it the whole time and so yeah those are the two biggest things i see with clients yeah yeah and uh so it makes sense to keep the ball rolling or keep momentum in motion and to make sure that folks who are dedicating their time or they they're looking to go on this journey that they carve out a set at least a set amount of time to 
do their practice to make sure they're clocking in their hours and paying their dues. Um, what are some strategies that you've helped facilitate for clients to help them in carving out that time and maybe weighing the benefits um, versus the, you know, the, the, the discomfort of, um, of going through the process. Many folks, like you said, life gets in the way, you know, their kids, family, work obligations, or they get sick for a, a indeterminate amount of time and it's difficult to carve out that time. And then others um, tend to, to be able to carve out that time and they, they weigh the, the, the path as much higher than other life obligations. Absolutely. And that's all true. And I'm a big fan of doing something every day. If you're pressed on life situations, that's fine. But something like the auto suggestion and the affirmations that come early in the steps, those can be done throughout the day, even if you have a life circumstances. You're always eating food and drinking liquid. So you can always impregnate the food and liquid with your affirmation, whether it's on, you know, and the most common affirmation I see in clients is I am having magical success. So even when life gets in the way, you can certainly do that. So if that's all you do in a day, um, when you're having a big day of stressful events, then that's all you do in the day. And that's better than doing nothing. You know, um, the, the other thing Barden only mentions a sentence of it in the beginning about physical exercise and stretching. And sometimes I think, you know, if all you're doing is physical exercise and stretching on some days when you're having a lot of life situations, I'd say that's a win. So I'm a big fan of just doing what you can. Another 20 minute exercise that I give to all clients, and I found this very helpful with all clients that do it, is just a simple kind of Zen Buddhist meditation of counting the breaths and you breathe in and out. That's one in and out. That's two in and out. That's three and go to 200. And if you lose count, the mind will race, you know, you'll be counting the, uh, breaths and the mind will kind of race in the background and try just not to lose count. And if you do lose count, you don't have to go back at the very beginning. Just go back to approximately where you thought you were and try to get to 200 breaths. And that will take 20 minutes a day. And sometimes I'll have clients just do that. That will strengthen the willpower. It will help with vacancy of mind. And if they can just do that every day and the auto suggestion that comes throughout the day, and, and this is obviously in the early steps for someone who's just starting, but um, I'd consider that a win, you know. Just do what you can, you know, even if it's less on some days. I really enjoy the Zen breath meditation that you provided, and I love how what you're keeping yourself accountable to is correcting course, and also you're also accumulating successful moments of concentrating your breath as opposed to starting all the way over and, and, and creating a loop of frustration. So I really, I really like the mechanics of the exercise you provided. I'm wondering if that type of mindset, that patience in the, your practice, um, how that translates into other exercises. Mm, well, that kind of patience, I personally, and this is going to sound like a very long time, but I took, two years with the poor breathing of the elements because I was enjoying working with the elements in the poor breathing of all the elements and learning how to work with them. And so I took two years with that. And so I encourage all clients to enjoy the journey and don't be in a rush like you're ticking off a list. But the most important thing is to enjoy the process. And so if you're enjoying the process, you're not in a big hurry to get it done. 
and you can just do what you can. And I also encourage clients to pray because that can get you in touch with the Akasha. And prayers can be simple and they can be easy throughout the day. You can just say, God, help me throughout the day. And that takes very little time. And so um, that will help with building the Akasha. I hope I answered your question sufficiently. Yeah, absolutely. I love uh, I love your inclusion and your connection of prayer to Akasha. I'm wondering um, if you can elaborate on on that as well. Well, you know, I think you're you're definitely praying to God and you're inviting God into your being in all ways, and it's giving you help, and you're getting in the habit of talking to your support and you can talk not only to god directly you can talk to all of your guides and your ancestors as well and so it's my experience that with clients a kind of warmth comes from that a kind of warmth and sometimes golden light that'll turn into ultraviolet light in the soul realm and so um you know, I think it really translates because the Akasha is um, a, a thing that can move. And so you're moving the Akasha back between you and God. Mm, moving the Akasha back between you and God. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, and um, I'm wondering uh, what steps do you find that uh, people tend to start really beginning to enjoy the process? Uh, online on forums sometimes people get very frustrated with the initial steps and then and then later on people tend to find certain steps or exercises that really resonate with them and so for some many people the earlier steps are those exercises that really deeply resonate with them yeah i find people really enjoy the zen meditation i gave i find that people that can get to the point or breathing with the elements really enjoy that a whole lot um you know i you know with step one with so many people getting stuck i always encourage clients go on to step two and keep doing the step one and do the zen meditation that will help you with the step one exercises and i also encourage clients as well to uh, don't go overdo it on the astral mirror. I mean, I have clients that will do 200 traits, and I just think that's overdoing it. You don't have to do that many traits and to do positive and negative. But to really answer your question, at what point do they start enjoying the process? I think it's most people that see me. You know, every now and then I'll find somebody that's just stuck and frustrated. But for the most part, people enjoy the process from the beginning. And I think they're excited to have a coach to bounce things off of. And a lot of times in sessions, you know, for an hour on Zoom, I'll just be answering people's questions they have in their practice. Yeah. And one thing that one question that's popping up in my mind is I'm wondering for folks who may be feeling frustrated or they're having negative self-talk about the process like oh this can't work for me or, I'm a special case or I have my I have a monkey mind and I'll never be able to achieve stillness what kind of let's say I'm a, a client what kind of advice or what kind of questions would you ask me in order to help me gain clarity or help me understand that I can do this work I can quiet the mind I can achieve these results um, well, I definitely give them the Zen meditation, but one, one thing that's important that I've discovered with that self-doubt, negative uh, self-talk is most of the time and almost all of the time when people have negative self-talk and feel like they're not getting through it, they're actually getting through it. They're actually doing a better job than they think they are. So I give them a lot of positive reinforcement that they're doing better than they think they are. And that self-doubt is common. 
but they're doing a lot better than they think. And that's, that's what seems to be the case. People, um, are doing better than they think and just having self doubt and needing to check it out with another person. Having a coach or someone to not only balance ideas and things that we've been processing in our initiation process is so valuable and, and, and helpful. Uh, I also wonder what, uh, what are some of the objections that people tend to have for finding like a teacher or coach, um, or, or having the humility to, 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 to themselves that say, Hey, this person has gone further in this process. So if I, if I can relax, if I can let go of my self image that I have to be a grand master of this process at, at this stage, um, what, what are some of those objections that people have and, and how could they move beyond them so that they can get the nourishment or they can seek out the help that they need? Well, you know, sometimes you'll get people that are ardent purists and they just won't feel like they're through the visualization exercises or something like that. And when I encourage them to go on, they can take the advice, but that's rare. That's probably about 5% of the people. And, um, you know, as far as objections, people have life circumstances that get in the way of doing coaching. Sometimes people are having financial hardship. I know here in the States, it's not the great, greatest economic time with all the inflation. So sometimes people will see me once every two weeks or something like that because they can't afford to see me every week you know so that's that's an objection so yeah i would say money and life circumstances is mainly the objection yeah yeah and i suppose not having sometimes people feel that they don't have enough time or that they, they may have like a like a, a schedule where they have shift work there's a lot a lot of circumstances that could get in the way um and uh what are some of the key pieces of advice you'd give to someone who was starting out and they didn't know anything about any other systems or frameworks. Um, and I'm also curious what advice you'd give to someone who has already tried everything. They've, 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 they've felt so disappointed with trying to get results in meditation or, or in magical practices. And, and they have a lot of doubt and, and they almost feel hopeless, but you know, they, there's hope in them enough that they're looking to learn from somebody or they're looking to, to maybe try once more. Yeah. Well, I will give them different methods to use from other systems if necessary. Um, I will also stress, and I know this sounds almost like Martin heresy, but I will also stress that um, some exercises I think are more important than others in getting through the steps. And so not to worry about certain exercises more than others. Um, yeah. does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. I think that does answer the question. And I, and I think I would like to go a little more into for people who've experienced a lot of hopelessness in the practice. Um, what are some ways that they can regain trust in the process or regain trust in their abilities to silence the mind to to go through the 10-step framework well to silence the mind i think the zen meditation i give is helpful i also think you know the time limits on the observation of thought and the thought control in the first step aren't very large and i think if people are doing it every day and they're discouraged, um, I will actually encourage them to go on to step two, um, do the Zen meditation, and keep going back over the step one exercises so you never really graduate from step one. I think step one is very key. I think the vacancy of mind is very key to the rest of the 10 steps. And so, um, and, and it's relative too, and it's objective. And it can be almost vacancy of mind. It can be vacancy of mind for a little bit of time, and then you lose it. 
but I kind of give people positive reinforcement if they're just practicing, if they're just doing it. Um, that is enough, and they can keep doing it and move on to step two. And even in their auto suggestions and affirmations, they can use um, an affirmation, I am mastering vacancy of mind. And that impregnation of food and liquid will help them practice vacancy of mind. I'll sometimes encourage them to pray a short prayer to God in divine providence before starting vacancy of mind. Um, but, but yeah, I, I do not, I, I don't like people getting stuck on step one because I think a lot of times they're doing it and they just don't realize it. A lot of times they're doing it and they don't realize it. That makes sense. And uh, do you, what are some ways for people who have family members or loved ones who may not be as supportive of, of the path or they may not understand, how can they do certain activities in private? Well, you know, they could basically keep silence about the Barton system. Um, I lost you on camera a little bit right there, but no big deal. Can you still hear me? Yes, I can still hear you. Please continue. Oh, okay, great. Um, so a little bit, um, they can keep silent about the Barton system and they could even just give like a lie to family members. They would say, I need to go practice yoga in my room or I need to do push-ups and squats in my room, which they could do that would help Barton. But um, they can just tell them something simple to get away. I want to read in my room for a while. Um, now, if there's not a vacant room, you can do it when the other people are absent from the house. Um, but, but yeah, I would just encourage if family members or people they live with aren't supportive, just keep silent about the Barton system. Chalk it up to something simple that people may be more willing to accept like you know just meditation or stretches you know or exercises and people may be more willing to accept that and then just it's no big deal and you go you go into your space and you practice barden sessions you ask can i use this room if they don't have their own room i need to just do some yoga for you know, 30, 45 minutes and then do them there. Yeah, that's great advice to, to advocate for yourself and to make sure your needs are being met is providing something that's similar, but not exactly the Barton framework, but something that people have space in their mind to understand or have a conception of. Oh, absolutely. I think advocating for yourself is definitely just an important life skill. Absolutely. I, I completely agree. And it, sometimes it can be hard to do too. You know, sometimes you can want the path of least resistance and have a hard time asking, you know, especially people that have suffered with anxiety or depression can have a hard time um, advocating for themselves. So, but it's an important life skill for sure. So yeah, I completely agree. Absolutely. And then speaking more on that, I'm wondering about ways that folks can better advocate for their, their meditation, magical practice, or their, or their practice of prayer. Um, what are some opportunities, what are some challenges that, that people have faced or client or, or not, not specifically clients, but what are some types of uh, challenges clients can face and what are some ways they have, uh, they can be able to effectively advocate for themselves and advocate for the practice that they're doing because life can and will try to get in the way and uh, having the skills to to put your practice first um, can help people maintain their progressions yeah and and some people do that some people are so excited to get started with the steps that they do that and put the practice first and you know some of the ways that they'll get stuck as if they're in a one bedroom house with their girlfriend or something like that. But I do think, you know, advocating for 
the Barden system specifically is not that important. I think it's inevitable that certain people won't understand it, you know, for instance, you know, um, I asked my parents not to look at my YouTube channel or my podcast. I, and, and not because they wouldn't necessarily be supportive, but because I feel like it'd be too hard to explain. So I would just say I'm a spiritual coach and leave it at that. So yeah, I, I don't talk about it with people that won't accept it. You know, mainly I'll, I'll just chalk it up to meditation. Mm. Yeah, that makes sense. And and how is it for having a partnership um, and and doing this type of practice? Because uh, some partners may be more receptive to the work or maybe even willing to try a couple of the practices with you, whereas other partners may not understand and might even feel repulsed by the practice. I think it's good to have a partner that will understand, period, you know, um, I would say if your partner doesn't completely understand there's some sort of issue in the relationship that needs to be worked out, however that needs to be worked out. So I think if, you know, the partner doesn't understand that's a relationship problem. Um, now, if they want to do some of the practices themselves, I think that's great. But I think it's better to practice them solitary than with someone else at the same time yeah to practice it solitarily so and I'm, I'm curious about the energetic components to that like what are some of the energetic components to practicing by yourself or when you're doing say like a group transmission of the akasha well in the group transmission i do it all and it's very interesting because I didn't do it for a long time because no one even mentioned it. And I almost didn't know it was a possibility. I had associated transmissions with uh, Eastern masters that give the Dharma lessons to people through the eyes. And I thought, well, I'm not quite at that level to do that. But what happened is, I had a client that basically asked for transmissions and I said, okay, I can try. And I tried to do the transmission on him for an hour. And he basically said that was tremendously strong. That was so good for me. And he came back for more transmissions. And then I started doing group sessions for transmissions every other Saturday. And most all people feel this strong energy coming through, even on video. And so um, that was something I just kind of fell into. And I'm very grateful that I have that gift. I didn't know I had that until people asked about it. And so I'm really, really grateful that happened. Um yeah, and the solitary practice does build the akasha for sure. Um, I think it's good to have privacy so you don't, um, you know, you don't get concerned about what other people are doing. You just focus on the practice. So um, I think that is good. And, you know, you can certainly, I mean, for example, prayer builds the akasha in me. And so... Um, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm very grateful I can do Akashic transmissions and people are so receptive for it. Yeah. And that's amazing that you had so much positive feedback from students provided that they're getting a, a tremendous amount of value out of the group and the one-on-one -on -one transmissions. That's awesome. I'm yeah. wondering about like, uh, for folks who may have had really cool personal experiences, anecdotal experiences. So one of the, one of the sentences in Hermeticism is silence is, is it silence is wisdom. Silence is golden. I've heard many variations on it, but, um, the, the key it's, it's uh, Solomon's pill, one of Solomon's pillars. Um, and so what is it? Uh, so how, what advice would you give to people to, on what to maintain silence of, um, and to whom? To mean like to, in, in regards to not only personal experiences but also 
just the practices in them themselves. I mean, I would encourage to keep as most silent as possible. You know, silence builds the power to tell people as least as possible. And if you really need to talk to someone, talk to me. You know, um, I think silence is key, especially in the beginning, you know. And I had to um, consider whether or not I would break silence myself and begin doing YouTube videos and a podcast and putting myself out there. And I decided my aim and my motive was to help people. So I decided to do it because it could really help people. But, um, yes, silence is golden. And even though I'm basically on the internet, I really don't talk about these practices in my personal life with people I interact with. Um, I just don't want to go to the trouble of it. Maybe some of them would be receptive. Maybe some of them are into wicked. I may give them a couple of exercises to do as a friend. But I certainly don't go into modern system. It just too much hassle to explain. Absolutely. If it's right for people and if they resonate with it, more than likely with the algorithms and everything else and synchronicities, they'll come into the work on their own and in, and in their own time. But yeah, yeah, absolutely. I kind of feel like people find this work when they need to. And it's kind of like when they're ready, they will find Barton. If they're ready, if they're called to do that, this isn't the only spiritual path. Obviously, there's others. You can reach high levels in many spiritual paths. Absolutely. We can reach levels in many different paths. Um, is there any resources or places where people can connect to you for coaching services, group classes, or follow you on your various social media pages? Absolutely, and I'm glad you mentioned that. Um, YouTube, you could just look up Clint Sabom, and I, obviously my channel would come up. And the podcast is called the Franz Barden Podcast, which you could look up on Spotify or um, Apple Podcast or wherever you listen, so that's pretty easy. Um, I do have my own website now, and it's a simple domain. It's just ClintSabom.com. And they can access me that way. But, you know, the simplest way to exercise, I mean, to contact me, uh, which is an exercise, but uh, to contact me uh, is just email me. My email is thegraveyardcowboy at gmail.com, thegraveyardcowboy at gmail.com. And emailing me there is good. And sometimes people need to talk about things a little bit before they start coaching you know and um so a lot of times emails back and forth happen before we schedule our first session so yeah the quickest way is to just email me and i'll respond to the emails and there's also like it's easy to connect with me through my website and it'll just go directly to my email yeah absolutely the graveyard cowboy at gmail.com that is a fantastic email name Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Kind of cool. Yeah. yeah. The last thing I wanted to ask you before we start to hop off is about your courses at Perseus. You have the step one to three course, but you also have three to six and seven to 10. Um, I'm curious if you can share those courses, uh, share some things about those courses with, with listeners and viewers. Well, well, thank you for checking it out. I'm flattered that you know about them. Um, the uh the steps through one and three is a free class um so i do the first three steps in a free class and i also have a paid class on steps four five and six and i usually link to it under my podcast and youtube videos obviously you can visit perseusarcaneacademy.com and get to them a lot of barden practitioners know perseus very well and um, the steps four, five, and six class, it's cheap. It's only $49. So, and, and the one, two, and three class is free. And so some of those videos I'll put on my YouTube page. But it's important to note that the step four, five, and six class, that's a paid class, is exclusive content. 
it can only be found in the class. It's not going to be found anywhere else. So, um, yeah, that's what I have now. Um, and, and, and I'll probably do more in the future for Perseus. I very much like working with them. Absolutely. And that reminds me too, that you have a, uh, a non duality type meditation course as well. I've, I've seen, or it's like a, it's kind of connected to Sedona method. Um, Oh yes, yes, I do. I'm glad you mentioned that. I do have a class on the Sedona method and it's kind of a condensation of the Sedona method, uh, techniques. Um, and that's usually posted under my videos and podcasts going to that. And it's, it's on teachable, the app that sells classes and, um, yeah, that's a condensation. That's T2. That's only $47. And I am a Sedona Method graduate. I took their entire class for about $400. But honestly, my class is a lot cheaper. So buy that. Buy that. Yeah. And the Sedona Method can help with all bar work, especially vacancy of mine. Especially vacancy of mine. Thank you so much for being on the podcast, Clint Sabam. And oh, we're speaking with you again soon. Yeah, absolutely. It was a joy being here with you. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you.